believe it is. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, M- oh, right. uh, NGC yeah. 235. I can well, just see him in the top right corner. To reach out yeah. and touch space. The hello we go. special tonight. <laughs> yes, and it's going to be a special show tonight. We've got the two hours of reach out and touch space, followed by two hours of music, two hours of ghostly, ghoulish music here on Astro Radio. This is Pete. You can get in touch the usual way. Pete at Astro Radio dot Earth. Facebook.com slash group slash Astro Radio Earth will put you in touch with us here at Astro Radio. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Going to go over to the chat area. Area now and there's some ghoulish people in the chat area tonight hi uh, ghoulish people in the chat area you're looking all very ghoulish and good uh, evening and we're awaiting the arrival of um beaker uh he's uh, he's lurking somewhere <laughs> and here he comes <laughs> Oh, no, it's steven <laughs> and steven uh, tonight uh, steve ramsden coming in as well hey oh. hi beaker yeah. Well, Steve, what, what, what is it with the scary makeup? <laughs> <laughs> God, what's the, there's some pyramids going on there somewhere. <laughs> the Julian's in Egypt the now. The oh. transparent. Yeah. I think, that I think Julian's come as the invisible man. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. so tonight we've got uh, two special guests, very special guests, actually. We've got Tom Bramwell and we've got Pran from... Uh, and everybody knows Pran. Pran's super famous around the world. And she, she was made super famous, actually, by, uh, by Steve Ramsden. <laughs> he's, he's in tonight. Hi, Steve. He's muted. That's probably the best way for him, actually. Um, <laughs> oh, he's unmuted now. Hi, Steve. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having Pran on the show. And I'm looking forward to listening to my friend Tom Bramwell. Is awesome. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to start off tonight. Um, uh, we're going to go around the uh, chat area. So, uh, Tom, so you're, you're Beaker tonight, I believe. That would be true, yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, it, it's... Howdy, everybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well we've, blamed, we've blamed Tom for creating a lot of things in a lab tonight. So uh, there we, we'll move on swiftly from that. Um, and then we've got Simon. Uh, where's he gone? Where's uh, Beetlejuice gone? Simon? He's vanished. Doing a tour, oh. isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's doing a tour. He's down at the Herschel Museum doing his, t- his tour. And Dave, what are you supposed to be? I haven't got a clue what I am. I'm just a green, probably the green goblin. Yeah. yeah. You'd have to look at, come on, on the line and have a look at the image of us. We look great. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Pran tonight, she's the ghost of the slew telescopes, I can tell. <laughs> she is, she's the ghost of the slew telescopes tonight. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you for having me. Ah, we are welcome. You're always welcome. You've always been welcome on Astro Radio. You can come on any time. Well, anybody can come on any time. We have no, we just, it's an open house. It's an open house here. And we've also got Julian. Hi, Julian. Oh, let me unmute myself. Yeah, hi. Uh, I can't stay long because I've got to do a talk for you. T- Who are you doing talk for tonight? What? Who are I've you talking to- for? No, I've got to prepare a talk for you for tomorrow. Oh, for me? Oh, yeah, because we've I'm, got Ellen, Ellen Valley tomorrow. I forgot. Yeah, I'm I doing the Ellen it. Valley Day tomorrow. I yeah. forgot all about I'm, that. I'm running late on it. Oh, uh, no, get it, get it sorted. What was it called? The why, why are the penguins on Venus? That's correct. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. You know, um, I've got trademark on that, don't you, Julian? I'm going to expect some uh, remuneration for that. Yeah. Have you? What yeah. you? What's your take on that then? I uh, understand. And every time, every time I see Frank, he's, he's dressed in a different costume. What are you now, Frank? <laughs> he can't speak. He's muted. He's... <laughs> and Kathy, you look like a black widow. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the sparkly witch, you know, oh, just right. to, yes, because I'm and a good Steve, witch, really. And Steve's come back as a, as a, a cockerel? Oh. <laughs> or not. A red it, it, it's salmon back as well. Oh. He's a uh, Beetlejuice. Oh my God! Right. Only say it once, yeah. not twice. No, don't say it three times. Say it three times yeah. So yeah, JD's. I don't know where JD's gone. He, he was here a minute ago and he's gone again. Now. Uh, I'm sure you'll have. <laughs> Frank, you're the Phantom of the Opera, I believe. No, the Phantom of the Opera is down there. Oh. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> that's, that's Ron. So we'll start off. We'll start off tonight. We'll we'll ask uh, Pran a few questions if you don't mind. Um, so, Pran, how did you, the first question we always ask our guests is, how did you get into astronomy? What was the spark that started you off? 
Uh, yeah, uh, again, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm from Vera. Uh, I was born and raised in Kosovo and just very recently moved here in the States uh, to uh, pursue my master's in planetary science at University of California in Santa Cruz. Uh, so astronomy has been part of my life um, uh, since I remember uh, when I was a kid, uh, uh, we had a solar eclipse going on in Kosovo and that was at the same time that we had the war. So uh, it was a very bad situation back then. So not many people really cared what's going on in the sky because we were at the point uh, life or death, you know, to survive. But uh, my grandfather, you know, wanted to show us the family what the eclipse was and it is just a phenomenon that sh we should not be scared and of course we did not have telescopes or solar glasses to look at that but he got a bucket filled with water and was trying to show us the eclipse in the reflection like that and it was not a total it was 95 percent coverage or so from kosovo but i'm sure probably it was visible from uk also in the in the in the 1999 so that was like something that I really enjoyed as a kid, as a four-year-old kid. And I still remember that day. And I was ever since always curious about the sky, about the stars, about planets and what's out there, what's surrounding us. And that's how it got me started. And the rest is history. But it's always been a pleasure and it's been always amazing to do astronomy. It somehow changed my life for good and I'm happy that I chose it. It, it certainly has changed your life for the good. But uh, what, you visited Australia recently. How did you find it down in Australia? Oh my God, Australia is like my favorite place on earth, not mentioning the southern skies. So my original plan was to uh, go to Southeast Asia and Australia and spend uh, two months or so to visit the whole continent of Australia, like do a road trip. Mm -hmm. But when I was in Southeast Asia, I found out that everything was going into a lockdown due to COVID. So I didn't wanna be stranded in Southeast Asia and I moved into Australia a little bit earlier than planned. And because all Australian territories were closing the borders with each other, I only was avail available to visit Queensland and New South Wales. The first two months were pretty tough because they were in a very strict lockdown and um, you couldn't go out unless you wanted to get groceries and stuff like that. So it wasn't maybe a lot of fun in the beginning but things started to get really good in Australia, uh, you know, in compared with the rest of the world. So I was able to travel down to New South Wales also and spend time in Sydney and, you know, visit beaches and all of that. So I went all the way from Cairns to Sydney, all the East Coast. So it was really fun, although I was unable to visit the whole country as I planned, but I met a lot of friends because I had been in Australia before also. And I had friends there and it was really, really great to catch up with them again and, you know, do some astronomy as well, you know, see the southern skies for a second time. I really enjoyed it. And in, in fact, I ended up being in Australia for five months because I could not get out of there. I couldn't go back to Kosovo because it was, you know, locked and I couldn't come back to America because my visa expired. So I was like stranded, but it was not the worst place to get stranded. And I loved it. It was like the best year of my life, honestly. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd love to get stranded in Australia. That's something. <laughs> I mean, do you know, I've never seen the southern skies for real. I mean, I've seen them on, you know, using remote telescopes and what have you, but I've never actually seen the southern skies. So what was it like to see the southern skies for the first time? When I went there for the first time, I didn't recognize anything in the sky. Even the ones that I already knew, yeah. they look upside down. So it, it really gets you lost. You don't know which constellation it is unless you maybe lie down in the ground and you try to really carefully look what it is. So going a second time, was it was really nice because I was longer, so I had the time to see uh, different objects coming up. So 
for example, this time, the last time that I was, I, I was able to see the Mange Mangelanic clouds, yeah. both of them with the naked eye. So my friend James and I, we drove all the way to the outback because that's my favorite place in Australia. And, you know, outback has really dark skies. And I, I drove out of town in the middle of the night and I, I, I stopped the car and looked at the sky so you could see the Milky Way like straight up in the sky. And there was nothing else, no light, nothing. It was so quiet and the Mangelanic clouds were both up in the sky. It was great. And I also had a, a phone app. I wanted to make sure, you know, which object is which. I didn't have a telescope with me, but it was nice just to enjoy it like that with the naked eye. It was really amazing. Oh, that sounds absolutely fantastic. So you, you had Stephen go over to Kosovo. How was, how was that as having Stephen over in Kosovo? Was it uh, good fun? Oh my God, Stephen is like my, my biggest hero. He's like my biggest supporter and always has been since I started my outreach program, Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo back in 2015. Stephen always has been supporting me, helping me with stuff, donating telescopes to our program. He did like everything to, to really help me succeed and uh, I am here today with my program and with my success because of Stephen. So in 2016 he came to Kosovo. It was really fun because it was the first international astronomer coming to Kosovo, you know. We don't have astronomers in Kosovo. We don't have observatories or, you know, people that would just come to Kosovo and visit for the heck of it, you know, to teach us astronomy. So Stephen was the first one who chose to come there and go out with us and do outreach. And he, he brought us some more telescopes also. So we went to a different cities and set up our telescopes and viewed at the sun. And of course, students get excited when they see, hey, we have somebody from another country that, you know, has really studied this thing and is, is teaching us about science and about the sun. You could see how many students wanted to take photos with Stephen and, you know, it was really, really exciting. I mean, Stephen is very famous in Kosovo, right? Oh, where is he? Oh, where is he? Is he there? <laughs> I'm here, yeah. yeah so you're, fam you're very famous. Well, he's very famous actually all over the world. We're not sure what he's... Whether, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, he's definitely famous <laughs> all over the world. No, we love, we love Stephen. He's a, he's a great guy. I want to correct Grant Vera. She made herself what she is. Yeah. I watered the flower, and she caused the bloom. So just like everyone else in our program, you give a little bit of help to somebody who is sincerely trying hard, and look how far they can go. Grant Vera is a perfect example of what giving a little bit of help to somebody can do. Yeah, it's absolutely, been absolutely well, amazing. Stephen has not just helped me out. Uh, he has helped a lot of people around the world. He has traveled to many countries. I know other astronomy groups that started out just by a little bit and then Stephen gave them, you know, the support and they're like, they, they run astronomy programs in their countries in, I don't know, maybe 25 countries <laughs> around the world. It's, it's amazing what he did and I will always be thankful to him for helping us out because today, Kosovo has an astronomy program that survived because of the support we had from Stephen and, you know, other astronomers around the world. And of course the companies meet and Celeste right. and all of those. So you did that for you. Thank but you. thank you for the recognition. I appreciate it. And uh, Kosovo treated me like a king, especially because I was a United States military veteran. My money was no good anywhere in Kosovo. Like I told you on the show, Last time I was on with you, they, they won't allow you to buy anything if you're a military veteran from the U.S. Ah, that's been brilliant, brilliant. So, Pran, you, uh, what, what do you see as your future when you've got your qualifications? What do you intend to do? Well, um, currently I am doing planetary science and uh, I always liked planetary science. I want to study planets, but I'm very big into minor planets. I love asteroids and comets, and I want to study them further in the future. Of course, my dream is to work with a large observatory or survey like Catalina Sky Survey or PanStars and be able to observe with their telescopes and 
track, you know, NEOs or discover, you know, potentially hazardous asteroids and refine their orbits and do all that stuff. I mean, I try to do that a little bit with the Minor Planet Center, like in an amateurish way. Mm -hmm. So my friend Hap and I, he's in South Carolina, we did a few confirmations, including the recent comet Atlas. Uh, so before that was bright, you know, it was just recently discovered in January and we were the first people to see it and confirm it for the Minor Planet Center. And that was so exciting. And, you know, I've done that a lot for a number of asteroids. So I would like to have to do something like that in the future as a profession. So uh, meanwhile, I'm also working with Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo because I want to uh, be able to build the first observatory in Kosovo. So uh, my team and I are trying to um, look for funds and be able to build that. So we're planning to have an observatory, a planetarium, and like a little small science center that every country in the world has except for Kosovo. And Celestron has recently donated a 14 in schmidt cassegrain um, telescope, which will be installed in the observatory once we have the building. But of course, we still need funds for the building. So if anyone is watching out there and wants to support our, our project to make the first observatory in Kosovo, feel free to donate to the GoFundMe link. If you just click Kosovo Observatory, you will come up with a link in GoFundMe. So yeah, that's my current plans right now. And of course, coming here to California, it's quite busy because grad school, you know, keeps you busy. So I'm just trying to keep up with that and, you know, build my professional background rather than, you know, what I've been doing until now, just, you know, observing and doing outreach and all that. Of course, outreach is going to be part of my life always, but now I'm just trying to make it a profession as well. Well, we wish you all the luck in that. So what, what, what would you say, um, if I was to ask you, um, what are one of the highlights of your, your career so far? I mean, you're so young and you've done so much. <laughs> so what's one of the highlights, would you say? Well, I know people say I've done so much, but I, I don't find it like, I, I don't think I really have done that much. Of course, you know, finding a, uh, founding an organization for astronomy in Kosovo was necessary. Probably it would happen now or later. Somebody would come up and make an organization, but I think that was the, the, the most important step to do to make an organization and uh, you know get the word out there and get people to help us and start something new in our country and that was very great because it worked out well i tried very hard to travel around the world to participate in you know star parties and astronomy events and get to know people you know get to make friends around the world and uh, you know, because of that, we, we were able to have that program survive in Kosovo because they always offered support and everything like that, just like Stephen did, for example. Mm. But of course, by making that organization kind of um, made people aware of what's going on in Kosovo. And people always liked my story because we know how Kosovo was involved in a war 20 years ago. It was totally destroyed and we are just trying to rebuild our country. We're trying to educate the young generation because it's the youngest country in Europe. And we're just trying to, to tell people that science is important and it's part of us and we have to know it. So. Uh, you know, going out there and traveling was, of course, a nice experience for me in my very young age. It was not always probably the best because there were times that, you know, it had, you know, financial issues involved and all of that because traveling to America and also being a female and traveling alone in so many countries and meeting people that you never met in person, you just knew over the internet. So, but it, it worked out well, and I'm very happy that I've been to all the continents except Africa, and I hope to go there sometime also. But uh, I, I'm happy that I did that, and uh, I just want to keep doing it. I want other people in Kosovo to have the same experience. I want them to have an observatory. What I have seen out there 
in so many countries when I come here in America and observe with so many uh, large observatories and I, I get access to you know softwares and you know meet astronomers and then I go back to Kosovo and I, I meet my friends and they have the same passion as I but they do not have the opportunity like they've never been in an observatory or planetarium before and, and that makes me hurt it hurts me and it makes me feel guilty because i want them to experience the same and that's why it's pushing me so hard to 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 make an observatory and planetarium in kosovo so at least we have something to show to these kids so they can enjoy it they can come together and they can learn about the sky they can learn about anything that a student here in america would probably have along his years when he grows up so yeah, um, you know, it's been amazing and I love it. I'll keep doing it and thank you all for your support. Well, what I'm gonna do now, if you don't mind, I'll open it up to the panel to ask you some questions if you don't mind. Absolutely. Okay, fire away folks. Okay, I'll, I'll open up uh, if that's okay. Uh, what about education back home? Uh, what, what do the schools teach uh, as far as science goes for the younger children? Yeah, that is uh, a, an issue because we don't have a lot of science going. Of course, you know, you will learn chemistry and physics and math, you know, the basics. But when it comes to astronomy, astronomy is like, it's, it's nowhere. You don't learn it as part of physics or part of geography. It, it's very, very little. You only have astronomy in the last year in the gymnasium, which is in the natural sciences, not everywhere. So, and that's only one subject in one year. And I mean, you don't learn astronomy and all the coordinates and all the phenomena just like within a few months, of course not. So, and even if they do, they only learn it from the book. It's like they never have a telescope to go out there and really experience or look at the Saturn to see how it looks like. I mean, in my outreach events, I had, I had people who told me, oh, I didn't know that Saturn ring actually can be visible and it can be seen for real. I thought that's only visible in, in the photographs with high exposure or something like that. And, you know, Saturn is a very simple thing. I mean, with a small thing, you can see it with a small telescope. But in Kosovo, you can't buy a telescope. You don't have access in, in any place to buy a telescope even if it is a very small one unless you buy it in Germany or somewhere and ship it back home and that was also an issue when Stephen Ramsden was donating the telescopes he had to ship them and then something would get lost and it, it was all this mess honestly but right now we were able to collect you know equipment and go to these schools and um make the, it available so when they learn astronomy or physics or anything when they learn chemistry we would go with our solar telescopes and and show them the sun in, in different wavelengths and teach them why do we see the sun like that what is the chemistry of the sun why do we have the electromagnetic spectrum what does it show us what we can learn from it and it, it was really really nice we were trying to go anywhere in Kosovo in every school like in the cities or in the rural places uh, we also work with the uh, University of Pristina and numerous times and also with the Ministry of Education Science and Technology in fact we had uh, we developed projects along with my organization so we would go to certain schools in Kosovo and offer them you know the practical side of astronomy so for example in gymnasiums they would learn about all astronomy but the if you get a student out there he was not able to point you which constellation is which or where is the polaris or why do you know which are the planets and stuff like that it's very simple stuff so we were trying to do that for the kids and we did astronomy camps and it's always cool because it's like astronomy always the sky, in fact, unifies us all. And it's, it's really nice to go out there and just observe and have fun and learn at the same time. Your passion for the hobby, I say the hobby for the subject is evident and it just uh, rubs off 
Well, it, it's it, almost it new. I mean, yeah. I get inspired from you guys. When I started out, I remember <laughs> with Pete, it's like I knew Pete like ever since I knew Steven and I had a lot of friends here in UK and it, it, I, it was nice to just know that I had the support. It kept me going. Yeah, we take it for granted. I think uh, certainly in the UK and probably in the States, we just take it for granted. We've got telescopes, we've got observatories, we've got planetariums. We don't have to travel far for any of those. And we forget that other countries may not have the access uh, as such. I hope that's changing now when we're in the 21st century. And uh, hopefully science will come to the, the younger children and we'll have more like you. Yeah, I very much hope so. And we're trying yeah. to, to make that change. Okay, yeah, I think uh, I'm going to hand over to Daz when, when we're done. I think Daz had a question. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> he's, he's going there. No, no. <laughs> Count Andy Briggs has, has got his hands up. Count Andy. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Trent, just out of interest, when you do your outreach, uh, um, what, are, what are people in Kosovo most interested in? Are they interested in the planets or the stars or, or is it just everything? When, uh, when we do outreach, uh, actually, especially in schools, we mainly do solar outreach because it takes, you know, place during the day and it's e easier to do that when the school sessions are during the day. Uh, so always their favorite telescope is the hydrogen alpha, of course, because they can see all the, the prominences and everything going on in the sun, like nothing that you can see with the naked eye. So, but when we do it during the night, planets is something that really fascinates them. Like Saturn, it's, you know, one of the planets that whenever they look in the telescope, it's like, wow, it really looks like that. And also yeah. the moon, the moon, when they see the moon that close, uh, you know, the craters and, you know, there are people that they see the moon all their life, but they never really zoomed in to see what it looks like. And they see the craters and they just feel like, you know, really, really uh, surprised. And I, I can I can understand that because that's how I felt when I first looked at the moon. Somehow it was, you know, an interesting feeling. I was scared at the same time to look that close because it was a new thing to see for the first time, but I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I think a lot of people. Yeah. And of course they, they, they ask sometimes like when we look for example, Orion Nebula. Oh, why doesn't we see it in color like the Hubble Space <laughs> Telescope, you know? So sometimes maybe people are disappointed that we can't see things in colors all the time. But, you know, I try to explain <laughs> them that our eye cannot see all the, you know, colors and all that. So it's interesting. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, uh, Pandera. Hi. Nice, nice to see you again. Like I said, I, we saw, I saw you up in, in Minneapolis. Um, love your story. Um, the story is also interesting too. A number of us here are remote observers. So one of the things I was wondering was if you were anywhere near sighting spring, because any of us that have done remote observing, if we're not in Chile, we usually end up uh, remote observing and stuff at sighting spring observatory. And the other thing that I was just going to say is that it's interesting too that, um, um, it might surprise you, I don't know, just the, the people that we're reaching out to in SLU, and we're so happy to have you as a SLU ambassador also, um, trying to reach kids in the larger cities. Some of the largest cities in the United States are some of the most isolated places and loneliest places there are. I recently saw a survey of how many kids that lived in Chicago on the south side of Chicago have never seen Lake Michigan, if you can imagine that. They're within a few miles of it. To see a star is almost as rare as it could be by you. Although they, if they can reach out and they can find somebody, the, certainly the, the telescopes are nearby. But it's a story for, for many people. So many young people now um, are, are just losing track of what's going on. And, and um, I think your story is gonna cross over to a lot of other types of places besides uh, uh, just the situation that took place in Kosovo. So did you get to get anywhere near Siding Spring? I wasn't sure when you were telling your story where you were uh down there. Yeah, I did not. I was not very far away from it, honestly, but I didn't not, didn't get to go there because I was not sure if the telescopes was, you know, the observatory was closed due to COVID. Yeah. So I did not even try to go there. But I work uh, with SLU. Uh, so uh, Pete also does. He's an ambassador. So um, it, it's a great thing to do because 
I, I started with SLU because there were certain things I was unable to achieve, to accomplish with my own telescopes because I got some tiny telescopes in Kosovo. So I wanted to be able to observe from telescopes that are larger in size, like 14 inch or 20 inch and SLU has those and you can access mm -hmm. them, um, you know, remotely anytime. And it, it's a great tool. And it's, of course, you will have to pay a fee yearly, but it's not expensive, especially for students. It's very cheap. It's $20 a year, I think. And it, it allows you to look at, uh, at both hemispheres because they have telescopes located in the Canary Islands and also in Chile. And that's the advantage of that. But also one other thing with me is that I travel all the time and it's impossible to have my telescopes with me every time. So when I have SLU, it's perfect because you just can access it anytime from your phone when you're like in the car or in the bus or just walking or, you know, staying in the home or anytime. And you can um, tell the telescope what you want to see. You can put in the coordinates. They also have like numerous catalogs and you just, uh, you know, you can go to sleep and the telescope will take the image for you. And then in the sure. morning, you can, you can just um, access the images, the FITS files. And if you are into astrophotography, you can go and play everything with your images. I, I don't do that very much because I, I, I am not very skilled in that regard. Um, but it, it was very nice to observe um, minor planets. I was very excited to be able to see some of the asteroids and yeah. get different images and then stack them together. And then you could see the asteroid moving in the background. Yeah. So yeah. it was really nice to do that. And I would recommend everybody who doesn't want to spend a lot of money buying telescopes, you can use SLU. It's, it's a great service. It's a great tool. In fact, I, um, I can't share the screen, but I was going to share some of the images that I did with SLU they're Over. all okay, okay they're all single stack images i don't right, go and right. st yeah i don't stack they the images but they look really incredible and that's great to use for outreach if you're in a distance and want to share something nice with your folks especially yeah, yeah. during this year we had a lot of bad things going on so uh, you know sharing something like that from the sky it was nice it was you, nice to do that you can share your screen now you can share your screen i'll give you permission to share your screen. One of the reasons, Prime Vera, that I originally met you at SLU and started doing SLU was a, a couple of things. One was because our, our, our skies are so overcast here all the time, so that SLU helped me with, me with that. And before the lockdown, as you said, I was often doing my astronomy on the train commute to Chicago using, because uh, they have Wi-Fi and we was able to kill that time doing, uh, doing things. Very nice. Yeah, some of these images that I did, I was like, wow, can did I really do it? Because it, it was interesting. I never was able to do astrophotography with my equipment. So being able to photograph some of the comets and some of these, you know, very known objects like nebulas and galaxies, it was great. It was nice. And then sharing them with other people and just giving a little bit of description what's <laughs> out there. So, yeah, I just wanted to, to give a clue to people that are watching that SLU is really nice tool. You can use it. It's, it's, you know, available for everyone. Anyway, I don't want to go with that forever, but I just wanted to show a little bit of the images. I'll They're fantastic. Fantastic. Well, what we're going to do, now, we're going to go over to a track and then we'll come back for a chat after this track. And this is the police yeah. um, walking on the moon and some of his buddies from work and they had built a rig to go photograph uh, Halley's Comet out in the desert and uh, my brother and I went with our 35 millimeter cameras and we put them on this rig it, it kind of looked like a big biplane that my dad had built and it sat on top of an equatorial mount and it sat there and tracked 10 SLRs on it uh, we would all open up our cable releases and drop a big blanket for a shutter and then we would all count five minutes and go get five minute exposure and then pull the blanket up over the rig. And uh, my dad taught me that, that long exposures captured more light. And if you rotated exactly with the earth, that you could gather that light and it would get stronger and stronger. And it, it, it blew my mind. And so ever since then, it, it just kind of like planted a seed of, of like wanting to see what was out there. Uh, and then as soon as, uh, my income level met the 
the same level of the cost of entry for for doing real astrophotography i i gravitated towards it so you work with i can never know how to pronounce it i'll let you pronounce it <laughs> prima lucha lab so okay. prima first yep. luce light laboratory obviously that's an, and, and were you the first non-italian to work for this company yep yeah so very small company based in Portonone, Italy, in the north, uh, near the Dolomite Mountains. Uh, I am the first non-Italian employee. So uh, I met them several years ago at a, a AIC conference in uh, San Jose and uh, met Filippo and he taught me about uh, the Eagle, which was mm -hmm. being announced at that trade show. And he told me what it would do. And um, when I saw what that could do for my rig, uh, kind of changed things from that point on. I became very good friends with the company, started buying their products, um, started contributing my feedback. Uh, and then eventually, it kind of seemed like they needed a pair of hands in the US. Uh, so it was increasingly obvious that I should be that pair of hands really. So I was, uh, I was actually working for Apple in uh, Cupertino for about 20 years and I was really kind of needing a change. I was, I needed to see and do something new and my heart was so involved in astrophotography that it, it seemed like a good transition and the timing was right. Uh, so I made a small investment in the company over in Italy. And uh, ever since then, we've been working on starting up operations here in the US. Uh, so I'll, I'll be handling distribution for them. And uh, I'm currently handling repairs. So now if you have a product that fails, it doesn't have to get sent all the way over to Italy and then all the way back. Uh, it can get sent to me here locally in the US and then uh, uh, doing support and uh, also helping with product development, which is fun. They've always got new things cooking. So um, for, the, for the listeners that don't understand or don't know what, what products you make, what are your product ranges? Oh, so we make uh, astrophotography accessories primarily. So if you think about uh, the Eagle computer, actually I can show you There's one right here. Yeah. So we make the Eagle, which is kind of everybody's favorite product from us. So it's, what this does is it's a Windows computer that bolts to your telescope. So we take the laptop and the table and all those cables out of the equation and move the computer to your telescope. And when you do that, um, what you can end up doing is your USB cables from your computer to your camera are very short uh, from your computer to your focuser, to your rotator, um, all very, very short cables. We offer uh, 12 volt power distribution. Yeah. So you can power your mount and camera and rotator focuser. Um, again, very short cables. Everything slews with the telescope so that nothing gets wrapped or snagged. And then what you end up doing is connecting over the Wi Fi uh, from any device your phone, laptop, iPad, tablet. Uh, and you can drive the computer remotely over the remote desktop. So it, it kind of liberates your setup. Uh, so we make that. We make uh, a motor called the Sesto Senso, mm -hmm. which bolts onto your existing focuser. So if you have like an external Crayford uh, focuser on your telescope, or um, if you happen to have installed the Feather Touch uh, Micromatic Focuser on your SCT, um, we can bolt to that and automate your focus, which is pretty convenient. Or if you need an external Crayford, we make a two inch, three inch, and now a four inch external Crayford focuser called the Asato. Um, we make rings and rails and basically everything you need to put yeah. your astrophotography rig together, except for the telescope and the mount. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And are, are these products, are they um, excessively expensive? <laughs> they look excessively expensive. Well, we try to make them look nice, but we also try to keep them competitively yeah. priced. So you can, get, you can get an Eagle. Now we have the, the base model Eagle just under $900 on the special yeah. rig. 
So um, by the time you figure, you know, if you were going to buy a, a reasonable astronomy laptop and all the accoutrement that goes with it, we're, we're not all that much more expensive, but what you, what you gain in convenience, you will be thanking yourself for it. Well, I'm, a, I'm always looking at convenience, me. I don't, like the, I don't like to be hassled by... I've got OCD when it comes to cables and things. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I've got to have everything tidy, otherwise I, 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 I get <laughs> stressed out. <laughs> well, so I do everything remote. I, I prefer hauling my rig up to the top mm. of the mountain and getting the really, really good photons. Um, there's a lot of options around my house now, it's just within an hour of home. I'm, I'm within 45 minutes of Mount Palomar here. Where mm. I live. So when I go remote, I don't like hassle at all. Mm. I don't like, I used to have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of cable and uh, hubs and all these tripping hazards yeah. at night. And now it's just a couple of interconnects. Once I place the whole thing preassembled on the telescope, couple of quick disconnects and I'm in the Jeep with my laptop. That's excellent. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, the, the others, nobody else is listening. Nobody anywhere in the world. Mac or okay. PC? It's, it's, it's a personal question. Mac or PC? Oh, you want to know from the old Apple guy? Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I've finally got an Apple guy to ask the question. Mac or PC? Because I don't know which way to go next with my next project. Well, so I, have, I, I now have no allegiance to the, the prior company, but I'll let you know I've, I've bought my last Mac desktop or laptop. Maybe a portable device. I, mm. I might, I will, I'll probably stick to iOS, but um, uh, all my computers going forward will be other. Ah, uh, so you, you've convinced me now. <laughs> but I, I don't, I mean, I, they're they're brilliant at what they do, but like I'm I'm not in the video production yeah. world, and I'm not in the art production world, and you know I like PixInsight is now my jam, and PixInsight works on everything. I have it installed on my yeah. Eagle, and I stack my frames while I shoot them. So I yeah. you know that's the, well, I'm, I'm it, it works Insight. everywhere. I'm a PixInsight guy as well, as you know. So I, I use PixInsight as well yeah. on my images. So. Yeah, uh, well, it, well, one of the main reasons was here in the Astro Radio studio, I mean, you, all you can see of me is two mics, but in front of me, I've got computers and, and all the rest of it going on. And um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the broadcast software, and especially even the BBC broadcast software, will not work under Windows 10. In fact, the BBC local really? radio have had to roll back to Windows 7 um, because the BBC software will not work under Windows 10. So um, I thought you were going to say Mac there for a second. No. So one of the one of the options we got. Not, well, I mean, the BBC aren't going to move to Mac because it'd be way way too expensive to to, to put two or three hundred computers in a in in one radio studio over to Mac. But um, it's something I've got to consider which way I'm going to go because if I want to upgrade the the radio studio, I can't really go Windows 10. So I've got to go Mac on that side of it because they do do the software for Mac, but they don't do it for Windows 10, which is uh, that's yeah that's shocking <laughs> so you know i kind of i kind of been forced down that road anyway so it's, it's somewhere i've got to go but what i'm going to do now tom i'm going to open up uh questions from the uh from fr from the gathered throngs here in the chat anybody got any questions sure, sure. tom yeah i do Stephen ramsey hey. oh stay Stephen. yeah hey brother so we you paid the bills man you did your job for uh for prima lucha let's talk espresso what kind of espresso machine yeah. are you using? How is the <laughs> so so Stephen wants to know about the coffee. So when when we go to trade shows of late, well, I what back when we had trade shows, uh, right. we we started serving uh, Italian coffee. Yeah, yeah, David David's got the right idea. But we, so we would stink up our end of the conference hall, something fierce with uh, the delicious, delicious aroma of coffee. And we would uh, run uh, coffee out to all the solar astronomers outside that were uh, keeping the people interested. So uh, yeah, that we, we served, uh, to answer your question, Italy Cafe from Italy, it's the Italian coffee. I think uh, John's got a question. In Exeter. Yes, John. 
Yeah, Thomas, um, can I ask you about um, compatibility with uh, the new Nina software, you know, the Nina control software? Have you mm -hmm. heard of that? Uh, so I I don't have experience with Nina, but I, I know it does providing... install and run on Windows. I'm sorry, it's glitchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you uh, well? It's very stable now, but uh, it's um, do you uh, envisage having um, native drivers uh, provided because Nina can use native drivers as opposed to Ascom drivers. Um, well, so if Nina has drivers for Windows, they'll work on the Eagle. So it's, I mean, there's really nothing preventing the Eagle from doing anything Windows related. So if the software is developed for Windows, it'll run on the Eagle. Um, I don't have experience with Nina. Um, so I don't, I'm not familiar with the installation process. But if, do they support 64-bit Windows, uh, Windows 10? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then we're good. Absolutely good. Isn't it, always, isn't it always down to the company to provide the drivers? It's not down to Microsoft to provide drivers for everybody. We had this problem with uh, Philips and the early cameras that they used uh, in the early days of uh, doing video camera. And mm -hmm. the problem when they changed and moved up to a different model, there was no drivers available. And people were saying, Microsoft, why aren't you providing the drivers? But it's down to Philips um, at that point to provide the drivers. So I, I would think it's down yeah, to the... Yeah, you have to get on your hardware Nina. manufacturers to keep on top of it, yeah. Yeah. No, nowadays, nowadays, we're mostly using ASCOM drivers or, in the case of mo modern control software, using native drivers from suppliers like Prima Lucha and uh, Pegasus and Altair Astro, whatever it might be, so, or, or Attic. I mean, for instance, I use all Attic native drivers. I don't use any ASCOM drivers which makes it much more stable and much quicker. Mm -hmm. Anybody yeah, else? Yeah, for our okay. focusers, we offer ASCOM uh, and uh, the native drivers. Yeah, we'll use your native drivers. Dave? Okay, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, I've been on the website very impressive uh, gear that you've got there. I love the, the red color. It's just absolutely stunning. I love this satinized be too, green. <laughs> yeah, well, be, but why did you choose red? Because, you know, other companies use well, orange and green. that's an Italian thing. Yeah. yeah I, I came along after the fact, and they, they're crazy about it over there. When I, I, I got to go visit the company last summer, it's, yeah. if, you don't, if you don't agree with that color, then um, you should steer clear of the building. <laughs> well, so it's it's not to do with Liverpool Football Club at all being red. No, 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 no not. <laughs> but you got a red shirt on as it's, well. It's a very Italian want? thing. Yeah, and they're very proud of the color. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. digital. Um, no, it's, the the equipment looks absolutely amazing. I'm sure, sure the product is of of high quality as well. I've heard good reports of the equipment and that. It shows good stuff. Now on the website, you can look at different images that you've got there. And I looked in the the workshop, and you've got a big, I, I'm going to say, radio telescope on show there. What, what's that yeah. about? You do radio telescopes as well. Yeah, we do. So there's, Ooh. there's kind of another side of the company. So, mm -hmm. um, Filippo, the, the president of the company, his, his love actually is, I believe in radio astronomy. He's, mm -hmm. he's both a lunar guy and a radio guy. And, uh, we have a, um, a, a group of products under the radio to space brand. Uh, inside the company that we offer uh, uh, a 2.6, a 3 meter and a, a 5 meter radio telescopes. Uh, 5 meter being the largest, actually. Um, it looks like we may have just uh, sold our first 5 meter radio telescope here wow, in the US, yeah. hopefully. So it's a uh, dish. <laughs> we have, we just delivered a 3 meter radio telescope to a facility back east, and now we have to figure out how to get there and actually install it amidst all this craziness. So, uh, yeah, I think that's actually probably the side of the company that's going to end up paying the bills more so than the astrophotography side. Yeah, I, I just think of uh, certainly universities, uh, they, they can do some research with that, couldn't they? Yeah, well, yeah. actually, uh, where the interest seems to be coming now is uh, our ability to track low Earth orbit satellites mm -hmm. uh, uh, with an antenna. And so uh, universities that have 
uh, programs that build CubeSats and things like that that don't want to have to spend time with uh, leasing time at ground stations. And they want to build their own are starting to email us. Mm -hmm. The word is starting to get out. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's a market there. It's good stuff. We're the only also ones for the really in the world that, that release, that, that produce a turnkey radio telescope mm. with Frank. a warranty. Well, I was just going to say also now, you may have heard before, we were talking on a number of us here do remote, remote work and go to sites. It, it, my understanding, there's actually at least one or there's starting to be some people that are offering remote radio telescope access also for, for amateurs. Are you familiar with any of them? You're not familiar uh, with yeah, okay. I mean, it's, I, it's all like lease time, I'm sure, but I, right. I'm sure that, that a lot of that time, well, if it's for like observing uh, hydrogen, uh, then you know, astronomy, then that's probably one thing. But I know like uh, ground station time is highly expensive. I think there's, there's big companies like Amazon that do it. And um, yeah, we want to well, try and is... uh, mitigate those expenses. This is something more than just for an amateur who's just trying to, you know, I, I tinker a little bit with it. I believe I had seen one site. I'm not exactly sure if I can find the, the link to that. I'll let you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, our own society, Liverpool Astronomical, and uh, Ron was one of the team back uh, in the 70s. Ron, you remember the radio telescope? So, Ron, you're still on mute. Yeah, long time ago, uh, late 70s, about 76, 77. Yeah. We say, uh, listen to the sun, um, 150, 151.5 megahertz, if I remember right. It was uh, on Something a down like converter. That, yeah. yeah, but it was basically a, 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 wooden, a wooden dish <laughs> made oh, with copper oh. wire. And it actually worked. We actually picked stuff up with it. Um, but we moved on since then. I think that one fell into disrepair over the decades. Um, we never continued with that, unfortunately. But we went into uh, meteor detection, which is, in my opinion, it's, it's radio astronomy. We're using the method of radio or certainly uh, bouncing the signal from uh, a meteor back to uh, the UK from France. Uh, I know John does that in a big way. But uh, yeah, radio astronomy is something you can do, but it's cloudy or daytime. Yeah, you guys can do matter. it in the UK all yeah, the time. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Different wavelength, of course, but yeah. Your answer, yeah. The website I was talking about here actually turns out it's called Salsa, S-A-L-S-A, -S -S -A, and they're from um, they're from Sweden, and they 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 ask for that people can control the telescope if they have an interest. And it's a much harder hobby than visual <laughs> and an optical work, but uh, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I see. I'm I'm checking them out. Yeah. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, that's that's very similar to the uh, smaller size uh, radio that, telescope. That that's why I brought it up. I assumed it actually might be one of your products. It was, it was what I was kind of wondering. No, but we'll, we'd love to sell them some radio telescopes when they need more. Sure. That's absolutely, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And yeah, I agree I'm really with what... looking forward to getting into that part of the, that end of the business. Just, I've just been all astrophotography really until this point. So this is yeah. like yeah. taking my mind in whole new directions, which is what I wanted. And I yeah, agree but, with what the other people were saying. I, that is one thing that you brought from Apple is that a, 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 your product is just beautiful. <laughs> and that was always one thing yeah, I appreciated I, about Apple was it is a very nice looking product. Yeah, I went from a company where, I mean, I was a gadget guy working for a gadget company. So I was kind of in heaven. And and really it 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 took the designs of our lead engineer, Omar Kaz, uh, I think he's brilliant. He's a brilliant engineer. He's a brilliant designer. And uh, his work was so good, it got me to quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Omar's. I love the products. And, and now being able to get my hands on them before they're released and actually offer my input and, and to be able to steer those kinds of things is uh, kind of a dream come true for me. You'll be pleased to know, I've just been checking that we, we, we have a sponsor here on Astro Radio, Rother Valley Optics in the UK, and they are a, they do stock your, your equipment. <laughs> I've just thought, but I just oh, checked very good. out. If they weren't, I would have got on to them and said, you need to stock it. But they do stock it, so uh, that was good. to uh, Excellent. We'll tell them there's exciting things coming in the, in the next few weeks. Just stay tuned. Thank Christmas you. is coming as well. Oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. I, I come from that era of, 
you make it yourself. I, you know, myself and others used to buy um, ex-military lenses um, left over from when the bombers were scrapped. You know, they had these big cameras on board with six-inch f4 lenses or f5.6. Um, we used to make telescopes out of them back in the day. But basically, everything was uh, what we in England we call a Heath Robinson. Have you ever come across that term, Heath Robinson? Basically, Heath Robinson oh. was a, a DIY guy who used to just throw it together out of Meccano and a little bit of wire here and things that lie around in the house, you know, in the shed or in the garage. And he used Rube to knock Goldberg. up. Yeah, the right, yeah. same idea, yeah. MacGyver so, is what it we It was call MacGyver, <laughs> or the A-team. Yeah. There you go, the A-team yeah. as well. But basically, you could knock up anything and have it do, you know, do an astronomy with it. And that's what we used to do. But then came the day where the prices started coming down. You could buy something off the shelf. Now you can buy good-looking equipment and quality and reasonable price and, and ready to go. Uh, you know, the likes of astronomy, uh, astro imaging, it used to be, a, it was a, a learning kit, it was a technique. Now people can just buy a telescope, it, sometimes with a camera built in, and go and take a picture of the Ring Nebula. That used to be so difficult yeah, back yeah. in the day. But uh, now it's, yeah, it's a lot easier for us. is to cut out the complexity yeah. and try and make things more uh, easy and approachable for everybody. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of that comes from that type of integration that you're talking about where like a product does more than one thing. You know? Yeah. But I think you're obviously listening to the customers, uh, the, the, the astronomers out there because cables uh, at one point, uh, I was using cables that were, my goodness, they were, they were three meters long. Mm -hmm. The signal would still get down the cable. Oh yeah. But, uh, you'd either trip over them or the, the computer would lose that signal for a moment and you'd have to reboot and it, it became difficult and you're never too sure where the, the break was on the connection. So you always have to fault find. Oh yeah. It so, could be anywhere. It could yeah. be the hub, could be the either That's end it, of the yeah. cable. So by keeping, yeah. Yeah. keeping Keeping that cable short, you're reducing all the hazards. You're also reducing weight. You're also you've got that wind effect where the the, the cables are whipping about in the in the breeze. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Which messes your images yeah. up as well. So uh, I think you're obviously meter taking those. Every cable that you have is an extra meter of cable you're carrying yeah, yeah. out to the field. If you're like me, you know, you, I carry all that stuff out. Like, <laughs> so, well, yeah. why do I a big big it? box. Uh, yeah. And and that's that's something you said about really being able to. The... Uh, Sorry. Uh, what Pranvira, you, you go ahead. Sorry. So um, I, I'm, um, I never had uh, much experience with film photography. Um, so I heard that a lot of um, astronomers who worked back in the day, they used film photography to do astrophotography. So uh, if any of you here has done that in the past, I would just like, you know, to mm -hmm. tell me and to compare it, what it was like back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The, the, sim the simplest answer is you, you, you couldn't tell for maybe a week until you got your images back from the, from the shop. Oh, that I'll, you actually got the picture. I'll run you through a process. I used to do. I started off doing um, uh, uh, film photography uh, way back in the day, um, a long time ago. <laughs> 1970, 1969 was when I took my first film photograph. And you used to put the film in the fridge. Uh, it was called hyper film. You put it in the fridge to keep it cool. And you got sat at the telescope. Now, the telescope in those days didn't have an electric drive on it. It had hand controls. And you sit at the telescope with a guiding eyepiece. You get a star in the uh, guiding eyepiece on the crosshairs. And you'd sit and you'd tweak these two manual controllers for three hours, sometimes four, <laughs> to take one exposure. And you sit there and do that. And my first photograph I ever took was the Horsehead Nebula. And I sat there for four hours, just twisting the hand controllers, keeping it on the, on, on the, on the object. And you had the hyper film in. And then when it was finished, you had to then send it to a lab to be processed. And you waited three to four weeks for it to come back and find out you got star trails all over it. So you then went through the whole process again. And that's how you did it. And the, the, the emphasis now is on the processing because the capturing is simple. I mean, if you're using a remote telescope, you know yourself, it's quite easy to capture. It's the processing. But in those days, it wasn't the processing. It was the capturing that was the hard thing. Um, and you left the labs to process it for you. Um, but yeah, so my first image I took was with a homemade six-inch telescope 
uh, where I ground my own, had to grind my own mirror because the telescopes were too expensive and uh, build it, build the tube out of wood and then sit there with it on a manual mount, tweaking it for three hours. And I probably did that up until I was about 27 years old. That's when CCDs first came out. Um, wow. And now, I mean, astrophotography for me now is the simplest thing in the world. It is so, so simple compared <laughs> to what we had to do. And, uh, you know, when I see people getting stressed because they've, they've taken four, 400 images over two hours and they said, oh, two or th a few of the frames have streaked and I, I can't cope with this. I'm going to throw everything away. I think you want to come back to the old days uh, when we wow. used to have to do it. So that's how we used to do it. Um, and it was Can I just add, Pete? Yeah. You, know, you know what makes me laugh? That little tickle at the back of me throat. It always makes me laugh that. Without a pass. That's a joke. <laughs> Apart from that. Uh, <laughs> what, what, it makes me, what literally makes me laugh is that image behind my screen now is Star Trails, which is something like maybe 20 or 60, 20 second exposures. And it becomes Star Trails. Back in the day, we used to avoid getting star trails. They would do a bane. You, you're trying to get pinpoint star images. Now people take images and make star trails as if that's the art. I, I never get it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said about processing, uh, you know, processing your own images. That was the way forward. You didn't have to wait a week. If you could process black and white images, you could be out there, take images of the moon or Jupiter or Saturn. You could get the, the, the camera back into the, the room. Your bathroom becomes the dark room and you literally process the images or process your negatives and then dry the film and process and print, you know, print off your images within hours of taking the image. Now that was the situation with the dark room. Sorry, Frank, I'm just going to go on for one of my long, <laughs> long rats here now. Um, my dark room was basically uh, the bathroom. The door was locked. I had to put a curtain over the doorway. So nobody, when they came up the stairs, the light didn't shine in. The, the bathroom window had to have a board put over it so no light came in there. And then I could put the red light on to process the film. So that was the way. So the way forward was to buy uh, in bulk your chemicals. So your developer, your fixer, and uh, any other agents that you used. And I bought from a, a local uh, photography shop a big bulk tin of developer. I think it was D76, Kodak D76 developer. And it was a big tin with powder in it. And I didn't understand the properly about the ratios one to four or one to three, so I could mix it up. So I literally used the whole tin and I made something like 25, I'm gonna say gallons, it's an imperial measurement, but 25 large <laughs> bottles of developer. Never realized I will never use the stuff. It would go off before I ever got to use it. But I didn't have anything to mix it with. So I, I mixed it all in the bath. So the plug was in the bath. I filled it up with the, I measured the water. I put all the water in the bath. I poured in this powder and I stirred it up with a big stick. This is honestly true, this. I stirred it up with this big wooden stick and I got this chemical all mixed up. And then I started putting it into a bottle via a funnel in the bathroom and I bottled it and capped it. And that was it. I then washed the bath out with a, a, a little, um, I'm going to say the, the shower. It wasn't modern showers as we have now. It was that hose pipe that used to stick on the tap. And yeah. I washed them. I washed you. Some of you remember them. I washed the bath down. I thought, that's it. End of the night. Ooh, I'll, I'll do some photography tomorrow. And I went to bed. Um, and a day or so later, my mum says, what's wrong with the bath? I acted <laughs> daft. And uh, I hope my sister's not listening to this because she'll, she'll know the secret now. <laughs> the secret will be out. And I said, what do you mean? She said, the bath, it feels like sandpaper. It's all rough. Now, we're talking a bath that was um, enamel coated cast iron not, not modern day plastic or fiberglass it was a cast iron bath with an enamel finish on it white enamel and basically the chemical had taken away the surface of <laughs> of the enamel and it was it was rough it was like it was like uh, emery paper or sandpaper <laughs> uh, and i just said to mum don't worry I'll, I'll i'll get the bath changed she never knew that i'd done it i just said oh, we'll buy a new bath we need a new one anyway so as a 17 year old i had i had to replace the bath but there we go Great days of photography. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> no, I, I wonder how long you're going to get away with that before the family uh, had something to say. Well, about, my, my mom, my mom passed away. My dad passed away. So I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what Statue I wanted to just, something Thomas had said that, that 
something that Thomas had said that I just wanted to bo bounce back out there, which is uh, it maybe went by really quick, but to me, it's very important. There's a number of products that I've looked at, not being the type of an uh, astronomer that's going to buy four or five cameras, three or four focusers, stuff like this. Many things I've looked at, whether it's new telescopes or new technology telescopes that are coming out that are outside of the US. I've contacted the company, how would I get this thing serviced? I trust it's a new technology. Well, you would ship it back to us. It's not a problem, sorry. I, I could never find myself to buy a product that I'm gonna have to ship to Japan or back to Italy to be serviced from the US. Um, uh, um, we heard stories from, uh, 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 from Stephen before, just, I mean, we just know those problems that could exist. So there's, I, I hope other people are listening. It, it, it just seems to me important. I can't imagine a, a number of these other companies wouldn't have somebody or some, some uh, independent doesn't decide to take on a number of these small companies for a service or something like that. Yeah, one of the things that happened that kind of upset me with, and it, this happened shortly after I invested in the company was there was a customer that had a, an eagle that, that had gotten wet and he needed to get some components replaced inside. So that eagle ended up getting shipped back to Italy. I had not come online yet and wasn't handling repairs. And his, his eagle got lost in customs mm -hmm. somehow for three or four weeks. And then when it was discovered, they just shipped it right back to him. It never even left the country. And so this guy got his eagle back like four or five weeks after the fact. Nothing had even happened with it. And, and he wasn't able to do any astronomy with it. And so that was, I was ridiculous. And so I, it was at that point, I was like, we need to move service here, like first and foremost. So they started sending me a pretty steady channel of spare parts and training me on how to rebuild things. And, and cool. that was one of the first things we did right away that, to help the situation here. That's, a, that, that's even, a, my nightmares are worse of just never seeing it again. I personally, when I was working for a medical company, I went over to Paris and took a, a 25 Toshiba laptop so that I never saw again. They never arrived, they never came huh. back, they were just gone. And, uh, yeah. Um, so, so that taught me a lesson. So yeah, I'm, I, I hope more, I hope more people are listening to what you're doing there. That's important for somebody like me. That's going to buy a product from, from, a I hope like our that. competitors aren't listening. I think we'll, uh, no, we won't let them know. Yeah. <laughs> I had a lot of trouble like that when Steven shipped me telescopes or computers and cameras. So, uh, Kosovo and Serbia still are not very good friends since the past that we were in a war. So everything that goes to Kosovo basically goes through Serbia and then goes into Kosovo. And there were so many things that when they enter Serbia, they just disappear and I'd never get them. So there were like very expensive cameras and computers and not mentioning all the solar glasses and other goodies that I was being sent and never received. So I can understand the pain. <laughs> yeah. Is there is there no preferred route to get equipment over to your home place? Uh, well, you, you must go through Serbia. Is that the only way? Yeah, but sometimes I try to do deliver things in person. Like I yeah. have families that live in Europe, in Germany or Italy. So if I ship things to them and then they come to Kosovo and bring them to me in person, that's much safer. And now that I'm here in the United States, in fact, I just have four boxes here with four uh, Skywatcher telescopes that Stephen sent me. So I plan to get them in person in Kosovo. So whenever I go there, I may not be able to get all of them at once but one by one so I can deliver them to AOK -OK so they can use during the outreach events um, so yeah that's safer than shipping yeah I, I think our panel needs to have a visit absolutely uh, yeah we, we'll all come over and just carry a bag for you how's that yeah well, good idea they will never suspect anything. I really want uh, people to come visit Kosovo, and uh, yeah. especially you guys who are in Europe, it's not too far away to come over there. So that would be really great. And we love having guests, international guests coming. We try to bring, uh, you know, aerospace engineers and astronomers just to talk to our students. We're actually scheduled to bring um, the Swiss astronaut, uh, Claude Nicolia, uh, for this year but you know COVID screwed that up so we couldn't do that 
But yeah, if you guys plan to go to Kosovo, let me know. That would be so amazing. <laughs> how how far is Moldova from Kosovo? Moldova? Uh, I, I don't really know. I can't... I don't know. Not... It's kind of north of... I think it's north of Kosovo, isn't it? Yeah, but it, it's not too close, not too far. So I don't know how to express it. In it's, in, it's, it's, it's in that direction from here because uh, I've been booked and it's either going to be next year or the year after, but I've been booked to do a talk in Moldova. So I'd, 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 I could come to Kosovo on the way back. Yeah, that would be <laughs> great. So let me know what time I hope I'm in Kosovo because, you know, with school here, it's, yeah. it's kind of restricting me when I can get back home. Uh, but, uh, you know, Europe, it's small. My brother lives in Finland and it only takes him three days to drive back, you know, to Kosovo. Mm. Like, I mean, in compare with the United States. So, yeah, it would be really, really great to have somebody over. Yeah, don't forget, Pete, that's the trip where I'm coming along and carrying the bass guitar for you. I'm not playing bass. No. <laughs> you are. You're taking the bass guitar. Shut up. Shut up. Yeah, <laughs> you are. You're not flying, are you, Pete? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, they'll oh. have to bug me first. They will, um, yeah. I hate yeah. flying. I hate flying. I Again, it's like the A team, isn't it? When it's, all, it's all right. We'll drive you, Pete. It'll be fine. We can. Me and Dave will drive you between us. Uh, <laughs> When I interviewed, uh, I think I can't remember which astronauts. I know I interviewed Neil Armstrong many years ago, and he said, "I said I really wanted to be the first person on the moon." I said, "But I'm scared of flying." He said, "I can see a flaw in your plan." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, it's only 794 kilometers. It says so you can walk that, right? Isn't that how? I don't know how to convert to out of Imperial. Is that is that walkable? I don't know. <laughs> what is that in inches? It, yeah. it's, it's about that far. <laughs> Uh, it's about that far on a map, is it? Something like that. I know because we, we laugh because I, when I was going to go to Siding Spring uh, last year before all this, and I had a car accident and ended up, it all didn't happen. And um, But I was going to go to Siding Spring. And then this guy I know who's, who used to be a fan of our band I played in, he said, I'll drive up to Siding Spring to see you. And I said, that'll be nice if you can pop up for the day. He said, yeah. He said, it's only a three-day road trip there and a three-day road trip back. I mean, we can drive. We can drive from the most northerly point to the most southerly point in a, in, in less than a day mm -hmm. <laughs> of Britain. Amazing. So you know, when somebody said three day road trip and he said he's just nipping up to see me, I thought mm -hmm. it's not, not nipping up as far as I'm concerned. But there you go. So what we're going to do? We're going to guys have those narrow those narrow boats, so you can actually take a week's vacation without crossing the whole country. That's the yeah, idea. Three miles an hour. Week, but you can take a whole week's vacation without crossing the county border on a ten mile an hour. Ten yeah. miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> we can. <laughs> a slow boat. We, we have, we've got a narrow boat um, uh, a docking place just up the road from me here, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you can get a narrow boat there. And I I got on a narrow boat there with my brother, and I went to a place in Wales called Llangochlan, which is just uh, over the border. And it, it took us a day from just up from our house into Llangochlan from here on the narrow boat. I can drive it in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's, it's interesting. But we're going to go over to another track now and then we'll come back to the chat. This is Thea Gilmore and Pirate Moon. <laughs> There we go. We can have a little break from being on air. <laughs> nice one. I, I'm just going to have a Drive drop out. For, I'm going to drop out for a minute and have a refill of my uh, Ribena. Yeah, my I've, got got water. I've, got, I've got me water. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on. on um, <laughs> Viaduct, aqueduct. What? Yeah. Oh. Ooh, ah. Pete, you muted. Dum, 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 dum. The only reason I know about your narrow boats is that my wife and I, as yeah. uh, um, in our lockdown, have been following a program called Foxes Afloat. Yeah, yeah. And and we've been following them all over your country on their on their narrow boat. And it's, I mean, we're talking religiously. We watched a hundred of their programs. It just seems like a wonderful way to. What was the guy? What was the guy's name who plays Han Solo uh, in in Star Wars? Harrison uh, Ford. Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. Huh? He he narrow boats from here. Up to Langothlin, Langothlin, regular, yeah. Right. Oh, oh. he it's crashes right. airplanes yeah. here in California. I like Harrison Ford. Yeah, the canal's yeah. two hundred yeah. yards from here. Yeah, it goes past you. It comes past you, yeah. if, uh, Ron, down to um, uh, uh, Whitting, near back of Whittington, then across. Yeah, I mean, the it, it's the Shropshire Union Canal, Langothlin mm. branch. Yeah. 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 Mm. 
And yeah. I live by the Witcher Charm. It's literally, yeah. the Witcher Charm's literally 150 yards away. Mm. Oh, probably, we've been following these guys so long, we've probably driven right down that canal. We watch them every week. For <laughs> you've been all over. If 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 you've been washing for a week, you've probably done about you've done about a mile. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most leisurely holiday till you get to that pont. I can never say Pontusillit. Pontus Pontusillit. Pontusillit. Aqueduct. Something or other. And the one side you're standing on the boat, and there's no rail, and then there's just that massive drop of about three hundred foot. It's Frightening. Mm. Uh, yes, yeah. I walked and some, over that. And some of these stacks were the little fifteen or sixteen locks, one after another. That's a real treat for those guys. Awesome. And you have to do all the locks yourself, don't you? So. Yeah. No. We got, we, I just we got hear a that a Welshman could yeah. pronounce something. What, what you say, Tom? Did I just hear that some, someone from Wales couldn't pronounce something? Thing. I'm not from Wales, I'm English. I'm on the other side of the border by about uh, miles. You, yeah. yeah, but you're, yeah, you can you're still in pronounce Wales. things in Wales, which is impossible. When you go over uh. to Wales, it's the only country that uh, they, they don't use vowels in their words, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we've, got, we've got a town not far from here, and there's not one vowel in the name of the town anywhere. How, how, how they actually pronounce it, I don't know, but there's no vowel in it whatsoever. It's, I am one mile from the, the only border. alphabet with Flem. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's yeah. Flem. Flem. Uh, yeah, yeah. How do you spell phlegm without spelling it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a it's two L's. <laughs> two L's in it. <laughs> because you get you get Flangolan and all that. Yeah, you get the people. Flangolan. People yeah. coming from Birmingham, and they'll say, because I mean, it, it it Pran says she's getting used to our slightly the slightly different accents. If she came to uh, Britain and uh, like where I come from the black country we've got a, an accent and I don't really use it on the radio because you wouldn't understand it and uh, like I was saying to the other the others the other night if I say to a, a, a lady uh, you talk too much I'd say yeah I'm like a gleed under a dower yo bin and that's that's my <laughs> accent from where I I'm from yeah, mm -hmm. uh, what was that? yeah I'm like a gleed under a dower yo bin I only understand open. No, I didn't even know. <laughs> <open. No. laughs> oh, probably something else in the black country. I'll, I'll, hold on, I'll just put what it did you just call home. my mother? What? <laughs> <laughs> um, You'll need a dictionary if you come over here. Yeah, basically, yaum, yaum is black country for you are. Uh, a gleed is a little bit of dirt that's caught under the door. So when you open it and it squeaks. So yaum like a gleed. So you're like a, a bit of stone under a doer, under a door. door. So when you open the door, <laughs> so that's saying that the lady talks too much. Oh, wow. are, are you speaking mm. that funny language again? Yeah. He is, Dave, he is. <laughs> well, I was just even thinking, when, Vera's very confused. Well, I, was, I was thinking when, when people pronounced the, was it, <laughs> I can't even pronounce it, Land Dudno or whatever it was that you said. Clang off. Clang off. Clang off. Clang off. Clang off. Clang yeah. Pravia, this is uh, in a place called Wales. It's a beautiful country, absolutely gorgeous with its mountains, its lakes, its rivers. It's it is beautiful, um, but they, they because of their own language, the, the, the names of the towns and the villages are just unpronounceable. Yeah. How do you pronounce something with three L's? You know, that's L, two L's or three L's in it. The funny, just... thing, the funny thing is that uh, because of the law, they yeah. have to put both the English version and the that's world right. Version yeah. both times. And uh, I, I lived on the coast of South Wales for 25 years, and there was a village uh, just up the road, and uh, it was called Saint Athan. And in English, it's Saint Athan, A T H A N. There's a big RAF station. There. Nice and simple, yeah. Um, but the Welsh, the Saint Tappan, they just moved in the T. <laughs> just the it but they both, they put them both. And you better pronounce time. it right. Oh um, yes. Well, what, what's the well, what's the one that as kids we always get told about? It's the the longest name of. Clanfer Pwgil Ogogoch. I got say it again. Uh, say it again, Ron. Clanfer Pwgil Ogogoch. That's the shortened <laughs> version. Yeah. yeah. And, and the long version. That's good. I can never remember it because it's yeah. another twenty or thirty letters yeah. long. It's impossible. It, it has a railway station, and as you pull into the railway station, there's the name. Of, of the, of the longer place. than the platform, yeah, it, it's too long for the platform. <laughs> it's normally abbreviated to Clanfer. So, we uh, 
Yeah. They did, we had um, a house they did and... change the sign on the platform. The Sorry, Thomas. PG, mm -hmm. And the locals got up in arms about it so much they had to put it back to the original. Because, yeah. uh, don't be fooled, though. Don't be fooled, Prime Bear. Even the, even the things you can understand can get you rolling on the floor. We were rolling on the floor yesterday just because two of the guys on the narrow boat were talking about touching cloth. <laughs> and I had to look it up. I was wondering, what is this? All? <laughs> look at him, see him all smiling? And it's just a, a simple little word here, touching cloth, and they're all breaking up already. <laughs> Lost in translation. Well, Thomas, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I, I'm watching out for Peter at the same time. Uh, you were saying, Thomas, you had a similar name? Oh, oh yeah. And so in, we have a house in Hawaii, and they have some crazy pronunciations of things there. And like the the state fish there is the humu humu nuku nuku apu a a. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoa, the okey cokey. I think I'd rather give yeah. Welsh a go. Yeah, <laughs> easy. Yeah. 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 We'll just watch them debate. Yeah. But that, that, that place in Wales is yeah. actually translated as the, I mean, I don't know, it's the little church on the hill by the something or other. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But there are some great ones in Welsh. For example, do you know what a jellyfish is in Welsh? I didn't know. Well, well there's, there's the word peth, which is fish, which, you know, comes in a lot of languages. <laughs> yeah. It's recognizable. So in Welsh, a jellyfish is peth wibbly wobbly. Pranvira, are you with that at this moment? A jellyfish? <laughs> Does that translate to your <laughs> own? Out in such space. This is Pete here on Astro. So we're we're going to go live. Yeah. <laughs> slash Astro Radio. Pete. Jellyfish is that thing of the season. Tendrils. If you want to get in touch now, coming up at ten o'clock tonight, in about half an hour, we will be going over to the Rock Show, which will be with me again. Uh, as anyway, uh, but we're going to be doing some Halloween tracks tonight, some monstrous tracks, some rock tracks, some, well, they'll all be rock tracks because that's all I like is rock. So, yeah, so join us then. But we're going to go back over to the chat area. OK, folks, we're back over at the chat area. So, uh, so we're astronomically, <laughs> we've been talking, obviously, we've been talking accents and um, we've all got uh, varying strange accents and uh, Dave especially because he's a scouser. I haven't got an accent. My mind's pretty straightforward. You're all talking <laughs> strange to me. Um, don't yeah. forget I'm a scouser. Yeah, Ron, Ron's a posh scouser. Yeah, you're you're, you're, you're out, out, extradited now. You're out there so somewhere. We, so I'm a Slopian now, if yes. Stay up our way, Yobin, posh Yobin. Um, so <laughs> astronomically, what have we got planned coming up? Have we got any uh, major events in the night sky coming up, folks? Anything to talk about? I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. I think there's a, a lunar eclipse coming up, isn't there? Uh, towards the end of the month. I think there is. I'm not. I think I don't yeah. know if it's available or going to be viewable in the U, in this. Yeah, I'm not, not too sure. UK. A couple of Gray's occultations. Has anyone observed a grazing occultation? Pranvira, have you ever seen an occultation of a star by the moon? Uh, not by the moon, but I usually mm. uh, used to do with the asteroids. Yeah, um, asteroids are pretty cool, aren't they? Uh, my friend mm. Jonathan Bradshaw, he has an observatory in his backyard, so uh, he tracks these every night when an yeah. asteroid passes in front of a star. And it's really cool because I, I mm. love asteroids. And I mean, <laughs> the photo here is like dedicated to that. So, um, it was really fun to do that. And I didn't know that, uh, you know, through an occultation, if you get enough observations in a, in a location, you can actually determine the shape of the asteroid. That's so right, yeah. it was really interesting to learn that because I never knew that before. And um, yeah, that's the only thing I have uh, done, uh, but not with the moon though. I well, know. It, the moon's I spectacular. Yeah. We can determine like the, the, the moon surface, like how it, looks like when it occults a star i think yeah i think uh, i think for amateur astronomers historically if you were to observe an occultation basically the the, the moon is moving against the star background um as we see it in the northern hemisphere we we observe it it moves from uh, as, as we look in the sky from the right to the left so it moves slowly uh, towards the eastern horizon as it does so it passes through overnight by night you notice that it moves into different constellations so it may be in gemini or taurus or leo whichever the constellation it be and it slowly creeps against those background stars there are times where it's spectacular because the moon will actually cut in front of 
the Pleiades, M44, the Seven Sisters. Sometimes it goes in front of a planet. And when you see Jupiter or Saturn or Mars disappear mm -hmm. behind the moon, it's like, wow. Because then you've got to wait maybe an hour or half an hour. It depends on the segment of where it cuts through. You've got to wait for it to pop out to the side. The thing was with stars, when you get the, uh, let's say, first quarter moon, you get that beautiful illuminated portion of the moon, which is following the unilluminated half of the moon, which is uh, preceding. And as it cuts in front of the star, the star will literally just go off mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there's no atmosphere. It doesn't twinkle away behind the moon's atmosphere. There is none. So it literally, somebody switches the lights off and it's gone. Now, if you can time the moment that happens and time it accurately and then wait for it to reappear on the, the bright limb, and get that time also you can actually determine that basically where the moon is at any moment in, in the sky mm -hmm. so you can then work out its orbit with plenty of observations you can monitor the moon orbit around the earth over time uh, something i used to do um, i never ever saw the results for months and months later because the observations got sent off to uh, tokyo and then i'd, I'd mm -hmm. wait for my my letter to come through the letterbox to say here's the list of your <laughs> observations and how accurate they were so it was, it was pretty great to get that back from as you, you know a big observatory it was like wow this is proper astronomy and i was adding something to research at the time so that was that but just uh, i mean to view the moon passing through the, the pleiades in a pair of binoculars it's spectacular oh, when you wow. see it going through a, a, a star field it's amazing oh by the way Dave, yeah. that, uh, that lunar eclipse you mentioned it's on the 30th of november yeah it's a penumbral uh, lunar eclipse. Um, I've got the data here for London. Mm. And um, it's not going to be too good from London because it's the penumbral phase starts at 7.32 in the morning and the moon sets at 7.37 in the morning. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's not, I'm not confused. And it's not also going to be that noticeable, unfortunately. No, it is. The, the outer and shadow, isn't it? The penumbra. Just, just to make it uh, equally depressing or more depressing, Historically, that day, the 30th of November from London, is cloudy 83% of the time. So. All right, well, then, that's, that's <laughs> we'll a kiss just give up then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. get to I think we but, stick to uh, radio astronomy, shall we, instead? Yeah. 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 Give yeah. you an idea, Panvera, give you an idea of something old school, like Dave was talking about photography. The club here in Milwaukee that was formed in 1932, in the 60s and 70s, they would do grazing oculations. And what they had was they had a cable that was a mile long and they ran it down observatory road out in front of the observatory and they placed people with telescopes at levels along this length of this cable with a little push button. And as the oculation would graze, each one would push their push button. And then there was another, cl there was another club, there was another club in Ohio doing the same thing. They communicated also then by a ham radio and would do a simple little grazing oculation to show the mountain ranges along the moon which you can do now with a high-speed CCD camera and a few people <laughs> really quick. So there's yeah. a lot of old school things that used to go on there. One of yeah. the things that's going on too, we are talking about different things that are going on right now is on SLU. The people on SLU as a community right now are working with Algol quite a bit. Algol happens to be at a, a, a point right now where it's, it, since it is a high, a, a rapid uh, variable star, um, people are, and in one night you can actually see it transit from minima to maxima. A lot of people are playing with that right now on there. And that's, that's kind of a fun thing that people are doing. So what, what kind of transit, is it a planet transiting or? It's a binary, it's, a, it's an eclipsing binary is what it is. But oh. you can watch it all in one night. It's so fast. It's not like somebody's eclipsing binaries that take weeks or days or months yeah. or something like that to go on. And uh, so that's happening right now. Um, Dave was asking before what was going on right now. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, yeah but uh, the, the, the moon's limb, when we look at the very edge of the moon, obviously we've got the terminator, that nighttime, daytime uh, section, uh, the dark, uh, shadowy edge. Um, that's the terminator, but when we look around the moon, that's the limb. Now, when we look towards the polar regions, you, if you look under high magnification with a, a, a reasonable telescope, uh, six inch aperture upwards, you'll actually see that the, the edge isn't, nice and smooth it's actually mountainous yeah mm -hmm. yep. and what what you see with a grazing occultation an occultation it just goes on off 
Mm. An occultation, a grazed occultation, literally cuts the moon at a tangent and it goes behind the mountains, pops out in a valley, disappears behind the mountain, comes out in another valley, goes on, off, on, off. And if you go with your stopwatch and go tick, 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 time, 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 and you, you monitor that, you can actually then work out the profile of the lunar limb. Right, which was right. then used at a later date for predicting what the total eclipse of the sun would appear like at certain times, because we need to know what the moons are and we look for Bailey's beads and look for where the prominences are going to pop out in the valleys. So when you see a total eclipse of the sun, you see these little reddish prominences or pink prominences as they, as they appear to the eye, but they're popping out between the valleys at first. So it's all tied in with observations that you can do as an amateur, but, uh, it, it, it's just amazing to watch these things happen but to watch the moon moving against the background stars is something I, I just love that and as you say with asteroids when you observe an asteroid you could be standing maybe two meters or ten meters from somebody and they will see something different than you'll see just that little difference in in your line of sight and it's the same with the greys we, we did the observation with a, a couple of societies uh, in the northwest. Uh, there was Chester, Macclesfield and ourselves, uh, Liverpool. And we would just spread across an area out in Chester. Some of us were only across the road from each other. We saw the on-off, on-off as it went behind the mountain and in the valley. But somebody just across the road didn't see that at all. It was a total miss. Yeah. And that oh, difference yeah. of perspective makes that difference you know it's uh, it is even if you don't see the occultation sometimes you contribute yes yeah not in that that's it but yeah. if you don't want to yeah. do it as a serious piece of uh, science you could just do it as a bit of fun and it's just lovely to yeah. watch yeah that was a big surprise dave what you had mentioned too about seeing the stars i one one night i was out watching a um a, a lunar eclipse Mm. And it was kind of boring and it never dawned on me. I went out, walked over to one of our large telescopes and realized I could now see all the stars around the moon, which normally I wasn't able to do at all. Yeah. So mm. next time if anybody's out and hasn't had that opportunity, you think, oh, it's just a boring lunar eclipse. Yeah. Forget the lunar part of it and just look at the stars that are right around yeah. there. Very interesting. Well, I, I seem to remember a long, long time ago, it was a time of a full moon. It was a total eclipse of the moon. And it was also an occultation of the Crab Nebula. Oh my! Because it's Crab Nebula is in the constellation of Taurus. It's it, it's within that band of the uh, of the ecliptic. So as the moon sailed through, it occulted. Mm -hmm. Now with the radio telescope, they observed it, and the signal went off, and then the signal Ooh. come on. So that that's something in itself, isn't it? A radio object. Listen to a pulsar being occulted by the moon. I think <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing that I was fascinated by was when I came up to the uh, to the Pexil Observatory, where you are, Dave. And we were observing stars in daylight. Oh, yes. <laughs> in, in, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon, observing Sirius. Of course. Yeah. Wow. Nothing unusual about that in Liverpool. <laughs> but I just found that fascinating. To see. I'd never seen it. It, it is. Life. I'd never seen it. But if you've been lucky to see a total eclipse of the sun, you, you, you know the stars come out. Those bright stars will pop out mm -hmm. into the sky. Um, you'll see the planets. Everyone goes, oh, there's Venus, there's Jupiter. But some of us will go, oh, there's Regulus, or there's uh, Canopus, or whatever, whatever constellations, you know, whatever mm -hmm. is visible at the sky. And the stars pop out. But you know where you're going to look because we've got planetarium software now and we can predict what's going to happen. Right. So you know where to look. But when you start looking for those fainter stars, and I'm talking of Deneb, Polaris is what, mm -hmm. second magnitude? You can see that in the daytime with a 12-inch aperture. Easy. Right. Um, but you've got to know where to point the telescope. Um, right. the, one of the funniest memories I've got was uh, with my friend uh, Chris Banks. We were at um, a star party in Norfolk, in uh, Kellen Heath in Norfolk. And we're in the fields on our campsite we got the telescope pointing into the daytime sky it was clear that day i remember it well that was very rare very rare day <laughs> but majority of people had been looking at venus which was further over towards the uh, towards the east and this uh, astronomer walks past i'm not going to mention him by name but he was a member of the british astronomical association so you know he, he was up there and he goes, excuse me, if you don't mind me asking, what exactly are you looking at? He says, I know Venus is over there, but you're not pointing over there with your telescope. You're pointing up there. I've got to know what you're looking at. And we said, it's the double-double, Epsilon Lyra, in, in the constellation of Lyra. It, it's uh, visible in the telescope. He shook his head. He says, I, I, I don't believe it at all. He wasn't doubting. He just said, I, I find that hard to imagine. Can I have a look? 
he looked through the telescope and he was astounded that you could see these very faint stars. Now these must have been down your third, fourth magnitude. Um, I'd have to look that one up. I can't remember offhand. But uh, he was fascinated to find that you could see these double stars in the daytime sky where normally he's only seen them in the summer sky. We're in September, September, October, where we were camping. Yeah, these are summer sky objects. Uh, he said, when I get back to London, I'm going to tell them at the BAA what I've just observed. They won't believe me. And I said to him, don't forget to mention it was the Liverpool Astronomical Society. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, you know, it, we do this all the time. So when we get, do our star parties, our outreach, uh, we do our best to show Venus. We, we try to show the planets in the daytime. And it's amazing to see Mars in a blue sky because that, that reddish orange colour against the blue background is amazing. Uh, Jupiter tends to be slightly washed out as does Saturn, but you can do it. Mercury, Venus, they stand out reasonably well. Uh, but the stars, um, finding stars, and if you get those uh, stars like Arcturus or Betelgeuse, or, I, I, I'm not going to say that three times. Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, <laughs> don't say it three times. Anyway. Yeah, he's, he's, he's busy at the moment, isn't he? We're okay. But when you see those coloured stars in a blue sky, you go, wow. And it, it, people, you know, they find it hard to believe you can see stars, but during eclipses, it's normal. Um, and the question now, as a kid, I always remember is, where do the stars go in the, in the daytime? Mm -hmm. my, my mother always said they go to bed. I think she was lying. I think she actually lied to me because then they don't, they, they stay up. <laughs> Enough of me. Over to somebody else. <laughs> I, told, I told you that one, didn't I, when I was uh, doing some outreach. And uh, that lady came up to me and said, have you ever seen the sun in Spain? And I said, I haven't been to Spain, actually, so I, I haven't seen the sun in Spain. She says, you've got to go and see. It. It's a different sun than you get here. Said, Is it? She says, yeah. She said, it's much hotter, that sun you get in Spain. It's different to the one you're looking at here. She said, you need to take your telescope to Spain. And she was adamant that the sun she was seeing in Spain was a totally different sun to the one we had here. And then the other one was that guy who said to me, he said his son was asking some nice, interesting questions. And his dad said, Listen, son, he said, the only reason we're, we're, we're not burnt to death, he says, we live on the dark side of the sun. He says, so that's why we're not burnt. <laughs> I mean, at that point, you have to kind of just scratch your head and... You know this is it? why we need outreach and educating the public. Mm, that's it. <laughs> and we need quality Stay products. In school, kids. Yeah, we, we need good outreach, quality products that look amazing. Crunch, so, crunch. There you go. And, there uh, go. <laughs> I'm sorry to have to tell you, Pete, we have had some of that gorgeous Spanish sun today. It's been absolutely glorious. <laughs> Away with you. Away with you. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't believe you. We haven't seen any today. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> I mean, it's uh, sun, that's why. <laughs> yeah, it's totally different. But, Prant, I'll tell you, I, I did some outreach with the two-meter telescope at a college, and I've told the others here this before, but uh, we had six schools come and bring their brightest students and then their physics teachers came with them and four out of the six physics teachers didn't believe we'd been to the moon what yeah <laughs> uh, oh, terrifying and, and those are those are those are the teachers that are teaching our kids here in the uk that's how, that, do they think the earth was flat as well pete no, no, well saying that you, you i'm just wondering laugh, but the, the the uk headquarters for the flat earth society is in chester just up the road here so they're closing in on me oh <laughs> pete all the time you attract them pete you do attract them I do. <laughs> they've got members all around the globe <laughs> yes all the way. yeah I'm in for you, Pete. Watch out. <laughs> well, there are also those folks that if you take images for from a telescope that it's not yours, that's not your image, right, Pete? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh you know, this is re remote imaging. Cheater. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not your work, is it, Pete? Oh, no, yeah. no, no, no. It's fake. I mean, I have to admit today as well that we've got a fake Christmas tree. So that just put the icing on the cake, didn't it? That we've got a fake Christmas tree as well. I've not only got fake yeah. images, I've got a fake Christmas tree. So that's <laughs> Are up. you trying to tell me that you do not go to Norway? I think buy a Christmas Norway. tree and bring it out. <laughs> Or I'll go anywhere now. <laughs> Let's tell. Should we tell Dave? Should we tell the Dave the, uh, the, uh, the the bad news that we don't have to look at stars during the day? That us remote guys can find dark place in the world twenty four hours a day yeah. somewhere. Hey, listen, <laughs> I, I've been observing uh, a, a, a supernova 
NGC514, so there's one for your telescope. It's, uh, a, a, well, it's very faint. Uh, it came in at 16th magnitude. It's flared up to 13.5, oh. I think it is at the moment. Um, I was hoping it was going to get a bit brighter. I've taken several images over the period of time, over a week or two, and I was hopefully getting an animation put together where you see it getting brighter and then it yeah. would fade away. And then we just have that lovely galaxy again. But it hasn't faded at this moment, so I need to get some time on the telescope. But I'm, I'm doing a remote telescope as well because, um, yeah, you know, I need an aperture that will get me down to uh, at least 14th magnitude to see was what that, I want. Was that the Plus, you can, do, you can do astronomy with your morning coffee. That's a real beauty. That's oh, that's nice. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember what telescope. T16, Peter, what was T16? Oops, we've gone off. Well, I'm not from very staring at the screen. Oh, but okay. Oh, oh, oh beautiful. beautiful. There, there we go. There it there is. We go. Mm -hmm. What I a coincidence. Recently in May, yeah, I yeah. think, with slow telescopes, this is yeah. the Orion's Galaxy M61, and it was really yeah. nice to be able to photograph the supernova. Wow. Wow. Before, before and after, isn't it? That's beautiful. That's, that's very noticeable, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, definitely. It takes a few weeks. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and then it starts, yeah. you know, going dim again. And it was really nice to be able to do that with slow. Just yeah. wanted to share that. So. That's beautiful. Well, well, we actually have we yeah. actually have a couple of guys on SLU that 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 have found have found the supernova before anybody else can yeah. because we can look so close to the horizon and the big telescope surveys won't do that. No. Uh, so they specifically come on SLU and uh, try to get their first thing uh, when the, when the observatory is open and take those first few shots looking down over the horizon before. Andrew, uh, the, uh, the the two meter telescope I've given you access to, Frank. That that does yeah. horizon. That'll, and, and Pran's got access to it now. There you go. Uh, that, that'll do, that, that'll do a right, because it's a clamshell uh, observatory. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is beautiful. Uh, That's big toys for the boys and girls. We only play with the big <laughs> stuff. Anyway, I want to thank you all for joining in the chat tonight. Have we uh, finished? Is that yeah, it? We've finished. Not not, yeah, I'm wow. going over to the rock show next. <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> but, uh, well, you haven't got to finish chatting. You can continue to chat, but I've just got to put. Course, the yeah, I've got to put the last track on. It's a radio show. We've got to say thanks to uh, to Brendan and, and, and to Tom as well. You know, Tom's yeah, Tom's been a great you. guest. Thanks, Tom. Well, thank come along guys. next time and just join yeah. in. I mean, the thing is, that, uh, we're on every Thursday, um, a Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. So if you just follow the link, it's the same link. You can come and join in the chat anytime. You just join in, and that's what it's all about. But I'm going to finish tonight yeah. uh, thanking Pran and Tom for specially joining us tonight, which has been absolutely fantastic. And Stephen, who's, who's, um, he's gone somewhere. He's mm. a word Stephen. Though. Yeah, he went earlier. Uh, so I'm going to leave you tonight with Pink Floyd and it's snapped and it's set the controls for the heart oh, of the song. song. There you are, you can chat away now. I was actually playing this the other night as I went to sleep. Nick Mason sort of full of secrets to a cracking version of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really good. Nice nice drums on it. I'd love to see them live. You're talking about using, Pran, you were talking about using the FITS files, Slew. You've not used the FITS files yet. Uh, no, because uh, to use the FITS files, usually you also have to snap quite a few images with uh, longer exposure to be able to do something. So I never really snapped like a lot of images to have like so many FITS files, but you can do that. I mean, if you really want to have a super nice image with no noise and all that, you can do that yeah. and you can download the FITS files. I think it takes 24 hours until...